Lakeland Public Television presents Currents, sponsored by Nisswa Tax Service, offering tax preparation for individuals and businesses across from the City Hall in Nisswa and on the web at nisswatax.com. Hello, and welcome to Lakeland Currents. I'm Bethany Wesley. The American Medical Association first classified addiction as a disease 60 years ago. Yet, it has been reported that 90% of people suffering from addiction will not seek help in any given year. 75% will never seek help or treatment. But there is a nonprofit organization in the area that is seeking to change that. Face It Together Bemidji opened last year, providing recovery, coaching, and support services to those suffering from addiction and to the loved ones of those with addictions. Tonight, I welcome to the program Margot Kelsey, the Executive Director of Face It Together Bemidji, and Warren Larson, President of the Face It Together Bemidji Board of Directors. Together, they are going to tell us all about the organization and how it is fostering long-term wellness throughout the community. Welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming. As we get started, why don't you give us a little history about the organization, because I understand Bemidji is actually kind of an expansion of an existing program. Yes, uh, Kevin Kirby is our co-founder and CEO, and this started in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So we're the first affiliate outside of Sioux Falls, but we are Bemidji owned, we are community owned, we're a nonprofit in our community. And so we started, um, do, Kevin came and spoke with uh, people in our community, Warren Larson being one of them, who is our board chair, and they decided to come to our Rotary presentation, do a presentation at Rotary, and that's how a lot of us on the board got started, and in our we actually had created our first meeting outside of that, which was May of 2015, our first board meeting. Okay. So, and they came and spoke in March of 2015, and it was Kevin Kirby and then David Whitesock, our chief data officer as well. Okay. And so it was a, a great um, meeting, and we kind of got started from there, and then due to a grant from the Nielsen Foundation was really how the meat of the matter and how we really then were able to hire myself as the executive director and get our facility up and running, which we opened September. September 16th of, last, of 2016 for services. Wow. So if he came in 2015, mm -hmm. this has gotten going pretty quickly. Warren, what did you hear from him in those presentations and those early conversations that you really connected with? Oh, well, the, just the whole disease concept. Um, I think that for most of my life um, and, and the people around me, we've thought of it as a acute disease where you would go uh, get treatment and then you'd come out just like you had a broken arm you got the cast off and okay now you're supposed to be well and once uh, and so once he started talking about it being a chronic disease and that uh, it, it's a long-term recovery of wellness and that these individuals suffering from the disease need uh, long-term support in the, in their in the process of getting well and staying well and that really made sense to me. Um, I'm a cancer survivor, and when I had cancer, my work community surrounded me with love and support. And I knew that when I was done with treatment, that there would be a job. When I went home, my family and my neighborhood gave me love and support. People came and they put up wood. Uh, they brought fruit salads. But had I went to treatment for addiction, I don't think it would have been the same. And so once we start treating people that are suffering from this disease the same way we treat people suffering from other diseases, I believe that uh, we're going to have a lot of success and people will uh, be able to live very successful, happy, healthy lives um, uh, managing this disease. Mm -hmm. And that really um, it was what inspired me to want to be involved. How important is it for Face It Together and for the community at large to really kind of combat that stigma and to really say, you know what, this is what it is and this is how we can help these people? I think it's extremely important. Uh, there's really two ways to look at this issue, and that is from a human issue, which I think is the most important, of course, and, and helping people out of that darkness. And the second is a monetary issue. Okay. This is costing us. Uh, this is an epidemic of financial proportions um, in our country, in our county, however you want to look at it, if breaking it down. And I, I think I sent you some statistics. It, in 2015, it cost the American business people $260 billion 
billion dollars. Last year it was 273 billion dollars. And that isn't doing anything for the disease and those suffering from the disease. That is just the pure cost and that is only what we can measure. So there's all these other So things. what is that measured from or what is it that so really looks at that? Absenteeism, um, we're looking at uh, the, the safety incidents, those types of things. And and when we look at though the ear, ear the things that we can't measure, I guess, is, mm -hmm. as, as tangible. We're looking at uh, pr brand. How, how does this affect a company's whole brand if they're dealing with someone presenteeism? How present is someone when they're sitting there? And it's not just those suffering from this disease. It's also their loved ones. Because you think this disease really hijacks a, a family and then the, the disease holds everyone hostage. So, and we've figured out that for every one person suffering from this disease, four other people are affected. And so, but inversely, if we can help that one person, four other lives are also affected. So mm -hmm. it's a win-win okay. with yep. that. Bethany, if you think about, um, if I had a family member that was suffering from the disease and I'm at work, but I'm really worried about what could be happening to them or um, it could be a child, a spouse, or, or someone very close, then I might not be as productive um, at what I'm supposed to be doing because of, of what's going on at home. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it's really about trying to not just help that person or even those four, five, six family friends, but the community as a whole. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like pretty early on the community recognized that this is a program that could have success here. Mm -hmm. What was it mm -hmm. that you saw in it, Margot, that really connected with you? I am in recovery myself. I have four and a half years in recovery and it was very difficult for me to get into recovery because I was that middle class person. I was a high functioning alcoholic. Um, there was so much stigma and shame around it that it took me a while to get help just due to that. Um, I didn't want to admit that I had this disease because of all of the pitfalls that happen along the way and it really does the stigma follows you and affects you. And so um, when I went to get help though, it was very difficult for me to go to an inpatient treatment center. It was just, even with insurance, it was financially not a available to me at that point in time. And so um, I was thankfully able to get into a 12-step program and then also get into counseling and get myself some help. But what really resonated with me is that how do other people navigate this? Because I had more wherewithal and resources than a lot of people did, and I still hardly could manage getting into recovery myself. And so when David and Kevin came and spoke, it was really emotional for me honestly to listen to this presentation because I understood that struggle and so I really wanted to be a part of this because I wanted to be able I'm from Bemidji I, I left and I came home and this is my home and there are so many people here who are struggling with this disease and I see this and so it was really important for me personally uh, to, to be able to create avenues for people and resources for people to get help because I know what that darkness is like. And I did a really good job of having all these facades up so no one ever knew how badly I was struggling. And so, um, you know, they, they just saw the, okay, well, Margot's fun when she goes out and has a couple of drinks, but they didn't get to see the aftermath of what that looked like and, and the depression issues that I dealt with and all of that uh, that surrounds this disease as well. And so it was, I thought it was, when I heard about this, I needed to get involved. Okay. Let's move into some of the specifics of what makes Make It Together unique then. Tell us, one of the words that we've heard or seen on the website is that it's a hub. It helps connect different aspects of the community. How does that work or how does, what does that look like? So we meet people wherever they're at, not just the person suffering from the disease, but their loved one as well. They can walk in, they are referred. It happens in a variety of different ways. But we, when someone walks in the door, um, we help figure out what they need. So it, it's not, it's truly a program that isn't, tailored, um, or it is truly tailored to the individual. It's not a one size fits all program. And so, um, and when they come in, we help answer their questions. We help them feel at ease. That's kind of the first step. The second step is, do they need services from us? Or do they simply need another service in the community that we're aware of and that we can get them to that service? Most of the time though, um, with the addiction issues they in this disease, um, 
the loved one or the person suffering comes and they do sign up for help with us. And then we have a recovery coach that walks next to them and then helps connect them with services along the way that might help them. So we're just kind of trying to create a toolbox. All my coaches are in recovery and uh, they have long-term recovery and are working some sort of program for the, of wellness for themselves. And they, so we get it. We get it right off the bat when, when people walk in the door and it's not from a judgment perspective. It's okay, sit down, have a cup of coffee, have some sugar, we, we get this, we understand this. Do you find that most of those initial contacts from an individual who wants help, he or she just really doesn't know what to do? Or like, do I go to this place or do I go, do I need an appointment? I mean, is that a big part of it? Is just yes. kind of explaining what the addiction, you know, the disease is and how you can address it? Yes, that's okay. a huge portion of it is that we need to educate people on what their disease is so that they can uh, properly manage it for themselves. And again, it's not a one size fits all thing. This disease isn't one size fits all. And, and it's very indiscriminate. It likes everybody. And so how do we uh, create a program that's going to work for that individual specifically okay. to make them successful? Um, and you know, I, I think when somebody tells you, well, you've got this disease and this is how it needs to work and you're going to fit inside this box and this is just, just do this and it's going to work. That's completely unrealistic. And we don't expect other people, other diseases to be managed that way for people. It's okay. What is your lifestyle? Like what is, what are your hopes and dreams and aspirations? What do you want out of life? Um, and we look at that for other people with other diseases and we don't look at that for this disease, but that's how people get well, is that they figure out how they need to manage their disease and then they effectively manage it in their lives. One of the terms you had mentioned was that it's a peer-to-peer -peer counseling. It's mm -hmm. a, your recovery coaches have been there. Mm -hmm. How important or how much does that help your clients or the people you're helping and feel more comfortable? It's a huge part of it. Um, when people walk in, and I think especially when people see me, they're like, well, you can't be in recovery. You know, you're the, the director. And, and I explain to people, it's like, we're all in recovery here. I am in recovery too. And th this look of relief, and you just see this, oh, okay. And then the second thing is, is how do I pay for this? How am I going to, and do you take insurance? And, and then when we look at them and say, we're free to the end user, there's other services that might require some financial assistance or whatnot, but here you, you're okay and it's free to the end user. And this re just overwhelming relief comes over them for that too, because there's so many barriers with getting help for this disease because of finances. And that's really terribly unfortunate. Does that help someone's recovery just in and of itself, not having to stress? I mean, I've talked about this with cancer patients before when they get help with medicine. I mean, does that help with not having to stress about the cost mm -hmm. or whether they're being judged? I mean, mm -hmm. that's a huge part of it because people will go out and, and relapse and use over those kinds of things or not get and, and say they'll relapse and then not be able to get back into recovery or get into help because of that. So when someone first walks in your door and says, you know, I need help, can you help us? How long is it before they're really starting to receive some of those services? Is it immediate? It's immediate. Um, they, they fill out an intake and they're talking to someone that whole time. It might not be the coach that they end up with because we really try to partner the person who's coming in, our clients, with a coach that has some of the same addiction cycles they have, might have some of the same um, child care is a huge one with chips cases and so have you are you in the system do you need help because you're in the system um, do you we are you a professional um, are you so we try and partner people together with a coach that looks like them so that they know that there's hope on the other end of this and that they see somebody who's already achieved this and so that I think that's a really important part of this is this peer recovery model where they just feel like they kind of have a friend um, and how I explained it to my mother when I first went to train, because she's like, okay, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, well, mom, it's kind of like being a life coach with chemicals. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Okay. The immediacy, though, is kind of unique to this field, correct? Because, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, but in some of the materials I read, there's weeks waits just mm -hmm. to get assessments before you get into the centers. Yep. For us, it's not. You can come right now 
And, and even if somebody can't talk to you right now, we have lots of things for you to do in a safe environment. So we have a computer that you can check for jobs, for checking emails, things like that, because that's a huge barrier sometimes for people printing out, simply printing out an application for somebody for a job can be a barrier. Um, people know they can come and that we have lots of literature, they can come and have a cup of coffee, they can just hang out and, and a lot of the times there's other clients there too and so there's kind of this camaraderie that's formed with people because they they get it and then they're meeting other people who are healthy or trying to get healthy and so it's a really positive thing because people places and things that's what can make us or break us with this and so if we're, we have healthy connections and, and other people in our lives who are trying to be healthy we're going to be more successful. Interesting. There's a term that you use, and it is recovery capital. Mm -hmm. Do I have that correct? Can you explain mm -hmm. that to me? What is that, and how does that really play into somebody building on their success? Well, we're uh, Face It Together is one of the first in the industry to create measurables for this disease. And okay. so the recovery capital and the idea of recovery capital is that the if you're working a program, it's kind of like putting... Uh, all these good things in a box that you have and so when something really happens it's hard you can take those tools out of that box and, and use them or that toolbox whatever we want to call that and so that's what we consider a recovery capital it's all the good things that we're doing for ourselves for wellness and recovery and the recovery capital index that we use is a measurement of whole wellness so is someone physically safe do they have access to nutritional foods do they have access to care? Do they have access to health care? All of these things are components to whole wellness. You know, even a spiritual component um, can be really important for somebody in getting into recovery. And so that is a great tool for us to look at specifics with an individual and see where they might be having some problems and so and the way that the questions are asked is in such a way that the people aren't lying they're not trying to there's no system to, per se to buck um, so they're really trying it, it, it's asking them um, in such a way so that they want to answer in, in, a, in a very um, honest way and then gives us the recovery coach a basis to start and then it's really cool because we do these at 30 60 and 90 days when they first start with us and they get to then see their own progress get better as they're starting to work on these different aspects of their life and their recovery okay interesting what are some of the programs or the services you can provide to the loved ones like if someone comes to you and says you know what i have somebody in my life who really should have help but isn't quite ready. Are there services if they came to you that you can help point them to? Yeah, actually we encourage them to sign up for recovery coaching themselves. And we have people who are trained in loved ones, uh, loved one coaching as well as the recovery coaching for the person with the disease. And a lot of the times people want us to fix the person who has the disease. We can't do that um, because they have to become willing and they have to want to help themselves. But what we can do is help the person who is the loved one navigate what is healthy, what is unhealthy, what is enabling, how do we create uh, healthfulness so that that one person's disease isn't holding everyone hostage around them. Um, the worst thing that we can do though is cut people off and that's what like people always think it's a black and white issue and it's not it's how do we help them create healthy boundaries so is giving them cash a good idea probably not no if they're actively using they probably need to find somewhere else to live um, how do we you know how do we create something so that it's healthy for both sides mm -hmm. and so we're very much actually half of our clients right now are loved ones oh, so okay. it's um, and that's very powerful and it's it's about giving and empowering that person to take care of themselves create these healthy boundaries so that they're not having to cut that person off because this disease isolates and punishes all on its own and then we as a society have this idea that if we cut them off that that's somehow going to make them healthy and that is the exact opposite of what actually happens. Um, so you can still be in somebody's life and give them love and connection and community without enabling their disease. And so we help people navigate that as loved ones. You said earlier that you really make an effort to meet people where they are at. Mm -hmm. And so does that mean that you 
have or would frequently imagine. So meeting somebody who says, you know, I think I need help. I'm not quite ready yet because I'm afraid of if I seek help, my employer might, you know, not like that or something. To Do you help prepare people to get ready to get help? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's simply talking with a coach and having that cloak kind of taken off of, of, okay, I can ask whatever question I need to ask. Because people are so good, they think, we as human beings always think that we're the only ones. And then we blow this irrational belief up that somehow we're the only ones who are affected um, or we're the only ones who could possibly have this happen to us. And so really we're not. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so I think that it's, it's a really powerful thing when, you, when someone sits down with a coach and they've created this little box around them from the world so that they can isolate themselves because of their, their addiction. And so when they realize that they're not alone, that, oh, you have these thoughts and feelings and this is how you did this and I'm not alone, that's an exceptionally powerful thing. That connection back to humanity, that you realize that there's a lot of messed up stuff with humanity and there's a lot of messed up stuff and thoughts we all have, but it's whether we act on them, how, how healthy we are with our choices and that we're not alone. Um, that's a huge, huge piece of this. I do have a question about the, the recovery coaches themselves are obviously gone through and are in recovery yourself. Mm -hmm. um, is it beneficial for you to go through this with new clients? Is it, does it ever yeah. put you more at risk for a relapse or anything or is it, is it more healthy? Do you feel like you're contributing? Um, I think that if it's the right fit for someone, it's incredibly empowering. And we actually get more out of it sometimes. We feel like we get more out of it than we're actually even helping the other person. It reminds us where we are. You know, when somebody comes in and they're in the throes of their addiction, it reminds us where we were and what kind of has happened in our own past, where we are now. Um, and that, I think that's very a, a powerful thing. Um, but, uh, and I'm sorry, we were just, no, I just lost my train no, of thought. No, that's fine. There. I did want to move a little bit anyways yeah. into the employer initiative because we haven't even touched on that. And yes. I would like to highlight that because that is unique. Yes. So tell us what that is and how it works. So it's a, a workplace initiative. And what we'd, we'd like to do, we actually have three partners already, um, Sanford Health, MedSafe Pharmacy, and Paul Bunyan Communications that have come on with us. And and what we would what we like to do is uh, go in and we train. We, first of all, we work with the management staff and we figure out if their HR policies and procedures um, are in alignment with what we're then going to talk to their employees about. And, and so usually people don't realize that the American with Disabilities Act covers all, some of this addiction, but it's only for alcoholism. So it's not for drug addiction, and mm -hmm. most people don't realize that. And so what we do is we actually help create that language in their HR policies oh. so that, that people can feel safer if looking at it in black and white. And then we work with their um, the management team to deliver this message to their employees that this is indeed a disease. We want people to get help. They don't need to be fearful of their jobs. This is a disease. It needs to be managed. It can be managed uh, like diabetes, a long-term chronic manageable disease. And then we offer education to their um, employees about loved ones as well as those suffering from the disease of addiction and where they can get, they can come in and get help with us. We kind of put together some key performance indicators with the businesses to figure out how we can track that um, but truly it's it's we're HIPAA compliant and confidential and so what I can do is go back and tell uh, say Paul Bunny Communications well um, XYZ so many of uh, employees um, this is the number of employees that have sought services with us and so we can prove to them that, that it is actually working and, and helping their employees and so it's it's we ask for a three-year commitment and it's a very reasonable cost it's forty dollars a head basically oh, in terms of the number of employees yeah. they have yep okay. and so we're looking at forty dollars a head and then a three-year commitment so that we can track and and look at those key performance indicators as as we go so that we can really see that we're getting they're getting a return and that we're helping mm -hmm. people Kevin Kirby uh, is a very successful business person um, and so I think he recognized at the very beginning in creating Face It Together that if we're going to work with the business community they like to have measured outcomes and so uh, they at the very beginning they worked very hard at creating uh, measurements so that they could show a return on investment so when we sit down with a 
business person or a business entity, we, we talk right away about return on investment, about uh, what this investment uh, can do for their employees, and that ultimately, that when we're successful at keeping their employees well, their organization is going to do better, and there's going to be a positive um, on the balance sheet. And, um, and so measurement is really important, um, and it's very important uh, in our relationship as we go forward and we have conversations with people in the business community. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're kind of getting to the final minutes here, and mm -hmm. I did want to ask you if um, if there's someone out there who wants to get involved, who wants to help or support you in some way. Are you looking for volunteers? Are you looking for yes. assistance? Yes, um, we're looking for volunteers, and we have lots of events that happen, so you don't have to be suffering from the disease to help us. Uh, we still need volunteers, but if you do have good recovery, we also are looking for recovery coaches. We're looking for loved one coaches, so if, if you've dealt kind of firsthand, but you are in a healthy place, um, please come in and talk to me and, and my, my team of people that are just amazing human beings and, and want to help. Um, and uh, we're looking for donations as well. We're looking for uh, workplace initiative partners. We need help with this in our community on every level and aspect. So check out our website, um, faceitbemidji.org. Give us a call, 218-444-9494 for more information. And uh, check us out on Facebook too. We have a lot of things that we put on Facebook and Twitter. And Facebook's a good way to hear about what's coming up and mm -hmm. all the events that are coming up. How many recovery coaches do you have and do you have a goal for how many you need? Um, I don't even know how to answer that okay. uh, because <laughs> we have so much need in our community so more 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 is better and and uh, right now we have seven recovery coaches but we we need more. Um, we need more. We need we need more. <laughs> we need to help more people. <laughs> what about the board, Warren? Are you guys pretty set in terms of what you need for board representation? Well, we are always recruiting um, and, and wanting to bring on more talent as far as onto our board of directors. Um, we do have an incredible group of very talented uh, members and they all bring uh, special expertise that is, is of great value. But most important of all, we've been successful at hiring a fantastic executive director. <laughs> and if we didn't have Margo, we probably uh, wouldn't have a, a building, a, a, an office, or, or, or any services at all. And so we're very thankful and grateful for the work that Margo is doing on behalf of the board. Thank you. Well, I'm thankful and grateful that you guys came to join me today. So thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in to Lakeland Currents. Please join me next time.